good morning. So the beginning of our course, we're doing a review on right, some review on numerical ODEs. And we saw last class, I mean all this as I've been showing to you is very, very simple. It's basically undergraduate, but that sometimes or most times we don't even see it in undergraduate courses. So let me write like this. Right, we saw three methods, very super simple. Scalar case, okay, our general nonlinear OD. So we saw this, and we saw the region of absolute stability. Let me do it like this, so it's even better. And we saw the region of absolute stability of these three methods, the Z plane, complex plane, okay, doing the, the test problem. Just look at last, last week's class. And we saw this, the region of absolute stability. So for the explicit order, sorry, implicit order, and your trapezoid rule is the right half plane, no, left half plane, sorry, left half plane, right? And we discussed that, for example, these methods, you have to know what you're trying to solve for, right? The, the, the test problem is when this is lambda y. And I mentioned to you that, for example, if we have a problem that's an oscillator, we are right here because lambda is purely imaginary, right? If we're trying to solve, solve the tr test problem. So, so since some people did not come last week, let me put it like this. This is the test problem. Right, but then we ignore this hypothesis. This was for the test problem to get these regions. And then we ignore this property. Now lambda can be anything. So if it's purely imaginary, which is for an oscillator, right, we see that, for example, explicit Euler is unconditionally unstable. It's no good because the amplification factor here is going to be greater than 1. I'm going to show you soon the remind you of the amplification factor. This one has spurious damping because the amplification factor is smaller than one. And for an oscillator, for example, trapezoid rule is very good. OK? So one thing that I might ask you, right? Because it's very simple, but very good to do. And not everybody here. Some of you, I know, have already experience with MATLAB or, or similar things, right? But some, not so much. So <clears throat> one good problem to test, to play with, is this system, linear system here, right? So this is a vector where with this linear system here, which is epsilon delta r real greater than 0, with this system here, we can play in the complex plane without using complex numbers, right? Because the eigenvalues can be real, complex, and so on. So if epsilon is 0, you have exactly an oscillator. And if you use this with this method, it will blow up. 
with this one, it will decay. This one, it will oscillate in a pretty good way for a long time. For example, for this problem. But there are problems that naturally have damping, problems that naturally have instabilities. So we have to know how to, we have to learn how to choose a method according to our needs, according to the quality, and so on. So this is a very simple exercise. It's good to get things going in, in MATLAB and so on. I mean, whatever you want to use, MATLAB or, I mean, we have students at IMPA can use MATLAB, but you can also use, I don't know, this Octave and Julia and other things. So continue with a very simple thing, which is things I told you last class. These are things you can teach to undergraduate colleagues, right? This is so simple. And actually, this spurious behavior, for example, this one's a spurious damping, something that we don't see so much in books. Too bad, because it's so simple. OK, so the amplification factor, so let me, let me write here what I call capturing with the jargon, the jargon of numerics and so on, right? We always want to capture the right behavior of a PDE or an OD. So capturing, capturing the solution does not mean to put the solution inside a cage, right? It's capturing is getting the behavior. It's the jargon, right, of getting the behavior. So capturing the solution for these three methods, let me put it like this, because I want to use, because the camera uses best this thing. So it's like this. Let me just give you an example. Let me go back here from this guy. So that so this means the method for the for actually the test problem. So capturing the solution, sorry, for the test problem, this method is like this. Right? This is the, most, the simplest numerical method there is, first order or the equation. Right? Super simple. Well, this is the same as this. Right? This is the same as this. And we keep on going. Right? So I can write that this is the same. As this, so this is like an exact solution of the discrete operator, right? And just for those, since you were not here, some of you were not here last class. This is the same as this, where I define z lambda delta t. Lambda is the eigenvalue that can be complex, right? See this matrix. For the test problem, it had to be complex with the real part. Negative, why? Because then the solution would decay, and we could test the stability of the method. But look, if I write this thing so simple uh, uh, here, right? Look at this. This should be approximating, let me put it like that. I'm first sure. writing. Right? This is the exact solution of this problem. Right? So this is the exact solution of this problem, time zero initial condition. Well, this is Tn is n delta t. So this is still the exact solution of the problem. Right? So, so I skipped one thing, sorry, I ended up too, too, talking too fast. So this, so the absolute value of this guy here, I want it to be smaller than 1 if the real part is negative, so it decays. So if I make this guy here in the complex plane smaller than 1, this is a disk centered at minus 1, smaller than 1. It's in this region. That's the region of absolute stability. You do similar things. For this method, this method, you get it actually for this one, it's outside. And for this one, it's the right, the left, I keep on saying it wrong, the left half plane. Now, capturing the solution for the test problem, I'm basically saying now that this guy here is trying to imitate, being informal here, right, trying to capture, that's it the behavior of this propagator here, right? Because look, this guy to the end should do similar thing to this guy to the end. 
So therefore, I can say that this And these are all in the notes, OK? The notes, as I mentioned, for this course, for the PDEs, it was in, in English also. But this one's in Portuguese, but it's easy to understand. I mean, at least some of the calculation. So here, in the notes, I wrote this. Okay, so if when I write this in, I wrote in the note saying capturing the solution, Euler's equation. So the discrete, the discrete operator, the difference operator, right? This discrete operator which has minor differences. This is just Taylor series, very simple Taylor series. This one's actually the definition of derivative in calculus, right? Just put this like this, divide by delta t, pa pa pa, right? So this is how this propagator which is the exact, you know, super simple, exact theoretical propagator for this simple problem is approximated by these guys. And these guys are, this one is the first, the first two terms of the Taylor series expansion of this guy, right? This one and this one are two different order Pade approximations of this guy. So this is, right, it's a rational function Approximation. OK, and usually when we use implicit methods, by the approximations appear. But all these are approximations of this exponential discipline, Taylor series. And these are by the approximations where this polynomial, right, the constant, degree 1, and so on. So. OK, and actually the trapezoidal rule is higher order because canceling, canceling um, terms in Taylor series. So that's a simple exercise you can do, too. It's like using these, how to combine these two guys into this guy and see that one term in the Taylor series is canceled. So it's a good deal. Another way of doing it, that's why it's called the trapezoidal rule, is that, we, as I mentioned last time, you can rewrite. Today I'm going to mention a method that uses the integral form of the ODE. You can use the integral form of this ODE and use the trapezoidal rule to integrate, and you get this method. That's why it's called the trapezoidal rule. OK? So all things. Simple, and since this is from a short course, mini course in colloquium many years ago, it's like there's more text than needed for you guys, but because it's more elementary, so that's why I have to keep on finding what I want to. Okay, so here's a problem which I confess I like it very much, and I think it, I got it from yeah, Lambert's book, which is one of the books I mentioned to you last class. Like three books, which are classic books on just numerical ODEs, very, very, very detailed with lots of. No, of details and so on. And actually, I was just reminded, for refreshing my memory, some of the proofs Lambert actually re refers to another very good book, which is thick and actually it's a book not only in ODEs, but by two very good uh, uh, researchers some time ago, which is Isaac, Isaacson and Keller. It's a very good book in, non -lin in linear, numerical linear algebra, approximation theory, and some other theorems. If you want to see the proof, some of the things, which I'm not going to prove here, they're, you know, they're time consuming and not trivial, but I, I want us to understand the theorems. You know, Lambert throws it to, to Isaac Sonic Keller, which is a really good book. And it's actually not, now things, everything is expensive for us because of the exchange rate, but it's a Dover book, so it's at least a, a not expensive book, Isaac Sonic Keller. So this example, I found it. Actually, when I was teaching, I didn't know this example when I was a student. And I like this example very much. I got it from Lambert. So let me write it to you, and then I'll ask you questions. Right? So let me, give me some minute. I'm going to write you two systems. So let's consider two systems of ODEs that look, the li look alike, alike, but they're not the same.
for this one and two. I forgot here to put the initial condition. System one, system two. And before I, I, I ask you a question, let me show you one thing more. Let me show you the solution of the system. Okay, using my notation of capital Y for exact solution and little y, sometimes here, no confusion made for the numerical solution. Okay, so we have two systems of ODEs, non-homogeneous systems, forced, same initial condition. And what I think, what I like about this problem is everything's cooked up, designed in a very nice way, that this and this have the same solution. It just happens. It's designed that they have the same solution. Right? Two different systems. I mean, they look kind of alike, not alike, but they have the same solution. Okay? This is the steady state. This is the transient, right? Terminology sort of dies in time. Transient. This is the steady state, periodic steady state, due to the periodic forcing. Okay? So, things we know, very simple. Now, last time I told you. Um, oh, which of these methods you want to buy, right? And I told you, even if I give you from, for free, don't take, any, don't take home junk for free, right? Use the junk if it's useful. I mean, it, then it's not junk. Pick th free, free things if it's useful. So now the question I ask you is, first, first question, solution is the same. So the, the, the class is good, started exactly where I need it. I want to capture the solution. Right? Now it's not this simple. Now it's this solution. It's not also nothing crazy, nothing that complicated. No complicated behavior. This guy soon gets out of the picture. And at the end, I'm just trying to get a sine and a cosine. Question number one, before I, I try to sell you a numerical method, I'm going to ask you, are these problems equally hard or equally easy to solve on the computer? And why? And just so you don't feel bad, if I had looked at this at the first time, in this example, when I was a student, I would, I would have to think I would know why. But I like this example. So it's very simple. So these things, after you see it once, then you start thinking in the right direction. Look, I'm trying to represent on the computer the same guy, which is not crazy, right? Just a, basically, it's a sine and a cosine, because the exponential dies out. So. Come on, it should be the same, the same difficulty on the computer. Well, that's the first reaction, right? The order of the numbers, so this is 99. Nine. We say these, are, these look like a little bit like ugly numbers, right? So we say, hmm, there's, there, might, there might be something there. But this, just because the numbers are ugly or, you know, it's not, so what's happening? I mean, or the other way. OK, you, can, you know that it's not the same thing, or else I would not be showing it to you, right, if it was the same difficulty. So the, it, there, is a different, there is a difference. We have to work hard, harder for one case than the other, OK, or else I wouldn't be showing this to you, to get the same guy. 
I'm going to have to work harder to get the same guy. That's, that's already one thing I like. OK, the hint, I would also think this, OK, this, high, this guy has these big numbers. Uh, you know, Mas was saying this maybe, or I think from what I heard, Mas was saying was speaking a little low, but you know, there's, these numbers are on different scales. That already makes me worry. But mathematically, what's really going on, we will see now. And it's kind of very nice and simple. And it relates with these things we've, we've seen right here. OK? So what happens, and actually at the end of the class, some of you, I think, I don't know if it was Masu, was asking, oh, will you talk about stiff problems? Well, here it is. This problem here is stiff. So what does it mean, stiff? Right? Usually it's stiff, we think, in terms of flexibility. It's a name that, it's the jargon. We'll see. Let me explain why, what happens, because then the, the definition of stiff becomes very clear. So let me write here and here the exact solution of both. There's nothing numerical up to now. I'm going to write the exact solution of both cases. Right? This is a linear system. Here's a matrix, right? We can diagonalize the matrix to try to uncouple things. We can try to find the particular solution for this guy, as you wish, right? So think in terms of linear algebra, it's actually good, actually good because we look at this matrix. We were talking about test problems, so we want to look at eigenvalues and maybe even the eigenvectors if I do a, sort of a decomposition. And then it becomes obvious, and I think it's a very, very nice problem. Okay, so here's the solution. Well, let me write it like this as vector form because it saves me time. So this the problem is I think is very cute, very nice, because it's very well designed, right? So, so look, look what happens. <clears throat> this is the general solution, right? Homogeneous part, particular solution, homogeneous part, particular solution, right? The, the, the particular solution is the same, actually, we see it here, no surprise. And what happened, what is the nice things designed by this, by this problem is that this problem, blah, 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 and the initial conditions which are the same, they both switched off one of the modes, one of the eigenvectors, the two. Alpha is 0 and beta is 0 for both cases, right? Because you only see this eigenvalue, minus 1, and the particular solution. Alpha 1 is equal to beta 1. It's equal to 2. Alpha 2 is equal to beta 2, which is equal to 0. It switched off this eigenvector, this mode of the solution. Right? Now, where is the headache? And that's what makes the problem stiff, right? And stiff problems, say, in PDEs and ODs, many times appears in sometimes computational, say, either biology or chemistry. Not necessarily, but things that have, for example, reactions, things that take on a very fast time scale. Here it is, very fast time scale. Very quickly, this guy, even if it wasn't the solution, it's not. But even if it wasn't the solution, this guy very quickly is out of the problem, is out of the dynamics. It decays very fast. It happens, it disappears from the problem. But it's a headache. It's a headache. This guy, 
This guy is not even in this problem, but it's a headache. Why? Well, if I'm using, if I'm using, look, now this guy here has a, it's all eigenvalues have negative real part. So I could maybe use explicit Euler, right? Here it is. But now, I have two guys to put inside the disk, right? So I have to, I have to choose a delta t so that two, two points are inside the disk because I have two components. I have two modes. So this one is easy to put inside the disk, right? It's minus one, so and so. But this one, even not being present in the solution, in the exact solution that I'm trying to capture, it's going to give me a headache. Why is it going to give me a headache if it's not in the solution? We can just think in terms of linear algebra. Because I'm, I'm doing finite precision, I have round off. And round off is kind of random, it's it, quote unquote, it's in all directions of R2. Right? It does, the round off does not have to be in, the, in, the, in this eigenvector direction. Right? It can also be in this one. And this thing will grow. So if you program, if you program these two guys with explicit Euler, this one kind of is okay. You put a small time step, it's kind of okay, right? Because this guy is more or less the same order of this guy. And here, we have a discrepancy of orders, a separation of scales, and that's a problem. And this guy, for this guy, I'm going to have to use a very small delta t. You can try it. I mean, you should try it. Maybe I put this in the first set of problems, because it's very easy. But to see. this course, in particular, is I, want to see, I want you to see the theory working in practice, right? Practice is a computer. So this guy here will force me to have a super small delta t and not for precision. I mean, he, this guy's not even the solution. And even if it were, I mean, after a while, very quickly, this guy is basically zero, eff effectively speaking. But I will have to use a delta t very small, not for accuracy, for stability. And that's the definition of stiff problem. A stiff problem is where you have to impose a very small time step or whatever, not for accuracy just for stability. Then, if you use implicit Euler, which for this problem is not that much, you don't even have to use the Newton's method, because you can get the matrix and just invert the matrix, you will see this. Right? For this guy, and if you, you use a small enough time step, whatever, you won't have much diffusion, and it's pretty much OK. Or, right, since eventually we want to see an oscillatory thing, we can also use the trapezoid rule. OK, so this, so implicit problems, and there's like, in the books, Lambert, there's a chapter on backward different, different schemes. All, both these schemes are backward. Remember, this is, this is also called, this is also called, this is a forward Euler. This is called backward Euler because the direction you do your Taylor series expansion. So usually backwards, Im implicit methods use backwards and so on, backwards uh, expansion. So this is a very nice problem to show the headaches and of, of stiff, stiff problems. And in essence, it has to do with this. Separation of scales and where some of the scales, which are not even relevant, in this case doesn't even appear, will give you a headache. And it's really nice. You program this problem here, and you see this eigen mode giving you trouble because there's round off, in that, there's round off error in that, di that direction, will, which will grow. OK, so then in this case, we have to pay the price. And it's not a big price, actually. It's actually good. If you use an implicit method, you can use a bigger time step, right? So it's not even a, a big price. For this case, on the contrary, it's going to be more efficient, right? OK, well, it's here in the notes. I'm not going to write. So if you want to solve this problem on the computer, but you don't, for this case, even for the implicit guy, you don't need uh, 
a Newton's method to find zeros. It basically, get this matrix very simple, invert it once, it's two by two, or invert it by hand. Okay, and da da. Okay. Now, of course, I can't. I can't go without at least mentioning a very popular method, if not one of the most popular, right? And you know which method I'm going to talk about? Fujikuta, right? So fourth order. Now let me write my classes. Which is also an amazing method, because how did these guys long ago, even before computers, right, figured out this cancellation of terms with in, in Taylor series and so on. So the method is like this. So Hunjikuta is like this. It's fourth order, right? So it's sort of, it, uh, right? It's global errors fourth order, which is very nice, right? If you sort of, if you, if you do the reduction of the time step by a half, right? The error goes down by a factor of two to the four. This basically is a sort of a, if you can think, this is like a weighted average. Look, one, three, Five, six, right? So it's a weighted average of four tests, different <coughs> tests with a vector field. So this is basically the vector field of Euler. Th these two are a vector field, like just sniffing halfway through the, through the time step. And this is like one going the full time step, but using somehow the vector field of the previous one. So also this combination that kills terms in the Taylor series. OK, and if you want to do the region of absolute stability of Rungakata, if you want to do the region of absolute stability of Rungakata, and then you, right, you put this in the test problem, you're going to get for the amplification factor a polynomial degree four. Okay, so to do things by hand is a bit complicated. At least for me, right? but, but it's a bit complicated, right? To get the region of this, right, this locus of the polynomial of degree four, but you can do it numerically and so on, and you will see that the region is like this. So usually we. Sometimes abbreviate in text RK4 as Rungakata fourth order. And this is the region of absolute stability. OK? So is this, this region is kind of, it's kind of good. It's kind of nice. Because not only the method is, is um, the method is higher order. OK? And for example, since I work with waves, right? Waves somehow is, a, is an oscillator in space and time, OK? So if I work with waves, and I work with waves, for example, if we have an oscillator of whatever, whatever means you want, and you have some 
something that looks like an imaginary eigenvalue, whatever, this method is good, right? Because if I put if I put my point here, my if, or here, see, actually, the the good thing is that sometimes having a little this means this means here that this little ear, right? Just like ear, this little ear of the region means that in this region here, I have a little bit of numerical dissipation. Do you agree? Because this is the region where the amplification factor is smaller than 1. And in the right half plane, my eigenvalue has a real, a positive real part, so it should grow, right? And on the border here is where the amplification has absolute value 1. So it's kind of close to 1, so it has a little bit of dissipation. In some problems, some people like to put a little bit of numerical dissipation. For example, in problems with hyperbolic systems or whatever sh shocks, people would like sometimes put a, some used to put a little bit of dissipation, get a little bit like a viscous shock instead of a shock, more regularity. But then if you pull it down a little bit, here you're actually on the border, so you can make your problem oscillate well. So this is actually a nice, a nice region of absolute stability of the fourth order Runga cutter. Okay, and the way the way you can do it is by by numerically you get this basically you get this polynomial and you go testing it right. Start testing regions, seeing the height and see if it's greater than one or not, and then you can draw this region. So this is one way of doing it numerically. Let's see what else I have here to talk to you. No. I think I now want to talk about. Where is it? Multi steps. Oops, I lost my notes. Where is it? one page missing. Sorry, got lost here somewhere. Here it is. Okay, here it is. Okay. So, then I can talk about Multi-step methods, right? I'm not going to talk about all multi-step methods. Of course. I'm going to talk about two classical ones um, commonly used. These multi-step methods are usually deduced like this. Through the integral form of the of the ODE, okay, or maybe maybe I think sorry, more appropriate would be to write like this. Multi-step methods. So how how does this method work? I mean, what is the the idea is that you have your f. So how do these how do these methods multi-step methods work? Is that okay? You can integrate your ODE, right? No problem. You write like this, and then you say, okay, instead of using Taylor series, I mean, it all amounts more or less to the same thing, right? <coughs> you now do a polynomial. Could be a Taylor polynomial, but a polynomial, as you wish, approximation for f, right? 
So for your polynomial approximation, you might use all these guys, even though your, your integration is only over this panel here, right? And depending if it's an explicit or an implicit um, method, you might use this point and so on. You'll see for, for the polynomial interpolation. For the integration, you've got to use this guy. So you use a certain number of points for a polynomial. You substitute this guy by a polynomial. And once you substitute this guy by a polynomial, you integrate by hand. Right? So you can look, for example, Lambert. This isn't December, but Lambert has it. So you integrate by hand. And then you get two. See, I'm going to have two examples of fourth order methods. So to get higher order methods, you, use, you need to use more points in your polynomial interpolation. Okay. So this is one of the ways you could do, as I mentioned, the trapezoidal rule. Right? Just put two points, blah blah, and integrate as a trapezoid. So examples of fourth order methods is basically. The Adams family. There's the Adams Bashforth. Let's see, I hope I can write both of them together. Let's see. So we can compare. And I have to copy the, the, num the numbers that appear, which are I never memorized these numbers. There's the Adams Moulton. Okay, so here are two, two fourth order linear multi step methods. In Lambert, for example, it's part of the sort of backward differentiation methods and so on. There's a big family of these guys. And this one is explicit, this one is implicit. Okay, so these numbers, these funny looking numbers, I mean, these numbers come out of integrating the polynomials. Okay, and here, we see that this one is explicit. See, this is the, this guy, and this one is implicit. So this one I would have to, if I were to use only Adams Moulton, I would have to find the zero of a function, right? Because I don't know the vector field at this time. I'm exactly trying to advance my solution. And this one I know. They're both, Fourth order, okay? And, um, well, I have here in the notes, there's the region of absolute stability for these guys. I'm not going to draw it. I mean, they vary a little bit here and there. And um, I took this from Lambert and so on, but you can see in the notes. But I want to I say one thing. Probably some of you have seen this, right? Can I use these two guys two together, and then they form a... a, a a class of methods that have a specific name. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes? Predictor corrector. So then, and, and we'll see why. We'll, then I'm, I'm going to make my salesman talk in, in just a second, right? Which one you want to buy, blah, blah, blah. But it's like this one is explicit, fourth order. This one is implicit, fourth order. Implicit, as we've seen, has usually better stability problems. Problems. Stability properties. Sorry. Properties. So I would like to use this guy 
So there's a very clever way of doing this. I would like to use this guy, but I don't want to spend time. How can I sort of not spend time doing at every time step a Newton's method? A Newton's method usually will converge because why? Because the, the initial guess for the Newton's method is going to be the solu solution in the, near, in the recent past. So it's a very good guess, right? The, Whereas the problem is a crazy problem, that solution changes so fast, whatever. But I don't want to do that. So people then uh, devised what was called this. So let me put this like this. No, oh, let me put it here. Right? So it's called predictor corrector. Why? Because I'm going to do an iterative scheme with this guy, and I'm going to use this guy as an initial guess. So let me, put, let, me, let me add a notation here. I hope people in the back tell me if you can't read it, OK? Because I don't want to move to another blackboard because of the video. Okay? So let me put it like this. I'm going to put a 0 here in yellow. OK? Let me put it maybe in parentheses because it's better for iterative scheme. Zero like this. I'm going to put maybe here k plus 1 and k. Very smart, right? And before I explain, right, before I explain the predictor corrector methods, Many times they appear like this. I will explain this sort of a, this brand name, if I may call it. Look at this. It's, very, it's a very smart thing. So you do your predictor, and you get your initial guess of the solution in the next time. OK? Now, k is equal to 0. OK, now k starts from 0. Say maybe until m m minus 1, according to my, it doesn't matter. So when k is 0, this is the guess that came from before. I compute this, and this is 1. It's my next approximation for this guy. Then I substitute this guy here, and I get 2. And then it becomes an iterative scheme. Poop, poop, poop. And I can stop this iterative scheme once it's within a tolerance that I have decided. Usually, OK, I'm not going to write this down, but I don't even have space. But usually, Usually in a situation like this, I recommend using relative error rather than absolute error. Right? Relative error is the guy minus, say, the previous guy divided by its value, say, to, to normalize. Because sometimes if I'm, using, if I'm working with something on a microscopic problem that everything is 10 to the minus 7, whatever, then you do the absolute error. It might be some name that look, a name that looks a number, sorry, that looks small, but you know, relatively speaking, it's not that small. When you use the relative error, the relative error usually gives in, you a rough idea of how many digits you have gotten right on the money, right? So if you do, if you do the relative error and you put your tolerance for the relative error 10 to the minus three, usually that means you have boom, 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 three digits that are matching. So that's good. And that's usually what we want. We want a solution, at least me, my problem, I want a solution with four or five digits of accuracy. MATLAB works in double precision default, so it's like 14, 16 digits of accuracy. Okay? So here, you can do that. But then, but then somebody maybe came up and said, look, look, look. Usually you start the problem, you test the problem, you more or less get a feeling at every time step 
how many iterations you needed to get, say, three digits of accuracy or five digits of accuracy, right? It's usually, I don't know, it's usually eight iterations or five iterations. And I, I get four or five digits of accuracy. And then to avoid in the computer doing a test, because usually a test slows down your code a little bit, right? If you put an if, all right, if you put a logic test, it usually slows down your code a little bit. Then people came up with all this very simple, which is a good way to do it, which is this. You then say, OK, I'm going to do only m iterations. Right? I know it's going to work, m iterations. I don't have to do any test. And here it is. This, I'm telling you guys what I'm doing. I'm doing a predictor, an evaluation of the vector field after I predict it, which means I predict it. And I do the evaluation of the, the vector field according to my prediction. I correct it. I do this m times, because evaluate, correct, evaluate, correct, evaluate, correct. And then once I'm done, I evaluate it again, because it's going to be used here. So this tells what you're doing with the predictor corrector scheme. OK? And this is good. You don't have to use any logic test, whatever, you just do it, I don't know, I want to do it eight times, ten times, sometimes even less with a, with a PD or OD because, you know, things change, you know, if it's a nice differential equation, for a very time step, small time step, the solution doesn't change much. So usually your initial guess is a very good guess. Uh, <coughs> Professor, you get an initial guess by using the first, uh, first time of the ellipse, uh, ellipse uh, the first method, yeah? You get an initial guess. And what will happen if you do it more twice? Would be the initial guess become better or just the same? It will probably be similar. But then usually the stability condition of this guy is better than this one. And the work is the same. That's the, nec that's the, next, the next comment I'm going to make. See, if you use this guy twice, well, there's no reason to do that because you have, it's going to be the same work as using this guy, and this guy has better properties than this guy in terms of stability, right? So you do this just to get an educated guess, and then you use it, you use it in the method that has a better, by being implicit, has a better stability region, right? And that's all, OK? So one thing that the way you were asking me, you almost pointed to another thing I should mention, right? But, but your, your question is fine, no problem which is this. I have an initial value problem. What, what do I do with this guy when I'm starting the problem? Because an OD is an initial value problem. right? So I only have y0. So if I'm using this for y1, this is y0, this is f0, and this is in the, before even the start of the problem. See, this is time minus 1, time minus 2, time minus 3. I don't know. Nobody gave me that information. Right? It's an initial value problem. So it starts at time 0. So what, 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 uh, what you should do? And the other question is, which I'll, I'll, I'll well, let me say it, and then I'll say what, what. What you should do, you can do. Maybe a few things. You can do a simpler method, a one-step method or whatever, to just go from time 0 to time 1, time 2, time 3. Now I'm good. I have a past to work on, to work with, and off I go. OK? That's, that's kind of OK. But if you really want to be you know, doing everything right, you know, and having everything fourth order, right? Uh, order, a one-step order method is not going to be fourth order. So what you can do is this is a one-step method. This is not a multi-step method. These are just sort of intermediate tricks, but it's a one-step method. OK? Runga cutter is one-step method, but just doing tricks in between and so and so. So what you can do is if you want to be really you know, rigorous with the order, whatever, sometimes it will, depending on the problem, it won't, I don't think it will affect much. I mean, but if you want to be, do everything nice and pretty from time one 
all the way to the end, fourth order, you do four steps or three steps with Rangakara, which is fourth order, and then you switch to multi-step. Okay. But then you could ask me, like you were asking me, right? I mean, then if you start with Rangakara, why do you need to switch the method? Why don't you just continue with Rangakara? Right? You ask me, why don't you stick to this one? Right? The answer is going to be different, right? I told you not to stick with this one because the work is going to be the same. Here's a hint. The work is going to be the same, and this one is better. So go to the, go to the better, right? If the better, as soon as the better becomes available, go to the better. Now, you could ask me, why don't you stick to Rangakara then? Since you already, you know, get four steps, why not go to Rangakara? Why are you going to switch to multi-step? Let me have some water. So somebody defend me. Why do I want to switch from Rangakara to multi-step? They're both fourth order, so it's not a matter of order. Here too, look. But no, no good. You're on the good track. Good. No. Yeah. Well, you're, you're kind of on the track. Good. I mean, people, let's let's help each other. It comes up. But here, look. Here. Okay. Let me help you. Here, I'm using the information here at four kind of different uh, different situations. Not quite different time because this time is the same as this time. That's why it's not a multi-step. Okay. And here, I kind of have four also. But that's, that's the way to start thinking. It's not the answer yet. So let me help you, OK? Because this is simple. But that, I like the fact that you're stopping and not giving the answer immediately, as I said. Because then the course, that's the idea why I give ODEs to start with. Also, first to communicate and to exercise the reasoning. And as you'll see, it's all very simple. It's just getting used to reaction. I help you, teach you to react fast, and, right? And then if you go to qualifying exams, right, react fast, or you're going to choose something to do in your research, you react fast, right? It's like training with a ball. You pass the ball, it's slow, and then something, you got to respond to fast ball. It's because of uh, function evaluation, in function evaluations, so that's why you were on the right track, but in terms of efficiency, look at at the Rangakara case, at every time step, I have to compute four function evaluations. And function evaluation can be something complicated. If you have a complicated vector field for your OD, and each function is a complicated function, it's a little, it's a subroutine, it's a, it's a small program, program, sorry, to compute that function, right? If it's some hyperbolic this or that, or a code, right? There's a little inside. So here, at every time step, I have to compute four function evaluations. In this one, no. Because, for example, when I'm doing the iterations here, these guys are from the past. I already know them. Save them. Right? So save them. So if you're programming this guy here, you do not need to save for the next step, k1, k2, k3. You know, you have to evaluate them again. For this one, no. Program in the way, program in the way, that this guy, right, are, are saved. And then as soon as you evaluate, you will, you will forget this one. And you're going to still keep this one, this one, and that one. So it's faster in terms of function evaluations. So the choice is you go from Rangakara to, to, Mo, to Adams Moulton, or predictor corrector, depending if if uh, you want to, uh, you have a sort of a heavy, complicated vector field that needs to evaluate, evaluate it might be time consuming. Because the order of accuracies is the same. You have to look at the region of stability. That might influence a little bit too, right? Because they're not exactly the same. But anyway, those are things to think about. OK? But you were, see, you were, you, you were on the right track. Oh, here's the notes. OK, let's continue. So now here's the definition, important definition that some of you, I'm sure, already have learned this.
So this is called local truncation error. So let me write here in, in, in a way. The local truncation error is, let me put this, the value that the, now pay attention to this, that the exact solution fails to satisfy the discrete, and here discrete we mean by difference, operator. OK, so let me use operator in the notation. So let me call the discrete difference operator in the notes I'm calling it um, L sub H or L delta X. Yeah, I, I used both notations that matter. I think L sub H is easy. So this is the discrete operator. And here is the differential operator. So this is ODE and this is the difference equation. Okay, I'm writing in a very condensed notation, but like to be on the on the right, I don't want notation to keep you from understanding anything, so let me write this like this. Right? No big deal. I just wrote the ODE in that way. Right? This operator acts on Y, tum, tum, and then would give you zero because I put this guy on this side. Right? And the other one is the difference operator, which is not a differential operator, so it means the numerical method, our, our discrete dynamical system right? that does the evolution. So my, as, as I mentioned, the notation from last class is that a capital Y means the exact solution of the differential equation. And actually, when I have this, this will mean a vector. Right? Sometimes I might just use Y if you get confused, complain. But usually, usually I want to try to stick with Y sub n as a vector. and capital Y of Tn as a function. This solution of differential equation, this solution of difference equation. OK? So this means, right, that, of course, the exact solution of the OD does not satisfy the difference equation. <clears throat> OK? So for example, for Euler, explicit Euler, <clears throat> sorry. this. Right? <clears throat> this is the explicit order, and this is different from zero. Right? So, right, the, the local truncation error as already mentioned, right, using the Taylor polynomial error, right, is this. So, <clears throat> it is ordered Order epsilon squared. Okay. 
Now, as I mentioned, I think I'll have time, but let me, let me mention already today, <clears throat> just make sure. The local truncation error, depending on the book, and I usually learn the, the first time like this, sometimes the local truncation error <clears throat> is this guy divided by h. Okay? So <clears throat> it depends on the book. I think Isaacson and Keller makes it divided by h and so others not. But the thing is that <clears throat> the method is consistent. I'll give you a definition when this guy goes to zero. So this is so let me mention this now. So yeah, because the, I think this will not come this today. So usually we say that the method is consistent. or the property of consistency, right, is when the local truncation error converges to, to 0. And as a note, Some books, I'm not going to write here because it's escaping my memory, but I think Isaacson and Keller, some books, which doesn't matter, just got, it's a pity that's different, but you just got, got to gotta, gotta, um, pay attention, is that some books, their local truncation error is LT already, let me quote unquote, is LT already divided by H, and therefore consistency means that their local truncation error goes to zero. Why is this? It's not a big deal, but what is the important, what is the important notion of local truncation error? Look, if I, if I were, maybe for what I'm going to say, I'm used to more defining it like this, but maybe for what I'm about to say, maybe it would be better to define like this, it's up to you, as long as you, make, as you make it clear. If I divide this by h, I'm not, I was almost going to do it here, but I'm, I'm not. Look, get this h here, OK, and divide it here. Okay. So this would be this one. Now let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me show you the way I'm used to doing I mean, I think that's how maybe Lambert does, is that this is the local truncation error. Well, it's not. I mean, this, this is the local truncation error. Right? which is what comes out of this. And if I divide it by h, this goes to 0. Okay, because, oops, sorry. because as we saw, the truncation is h2. And actually, the global error would be order 1, because this accumulates. We discussed this last time. So it's OK. That means that, means that as my grid becomes some finer and finer, right, h going to 0, I am, my error is, my error is, Sort of disappearing, asymptotically going to zero. Good, right? But this, this, this other way of saying it too, which is the way I don't use it so much. Maybe it's better for what I'm, I'm going to say now. Divide this, this, by h. Do it in your heads. It's very simple. This is going to look like an approximation of a derivative minus the vector field, right? And this is going to be equal to this without this 2 here, right? So it's also going to go to 0, right? But let me put this back, because this is the way I'm defining. So there are two things which I'm going to mention next class, which are very important in differential, numerical differential equations, be it ODE, be it PD, which is consistency and stability. We saw absolute stability. I'm going to give you another notion of stability, which is more important for convergence. OK? But right now, we have then the notion, the notion of consistency, right, is somehow, will be somehow associated, which is very important. So consistency and stability, there's some theorems that tell you that you're guaranteed if you have these two things, consistency and stability, you have convergence. Okay? Con so consistency is somehow a notion of a proximity quote unquote, of operators. And stability is somehow a notion 
of proximity of solutions. You perturb it, it doesn't go right, as we see well posedness in differential equations. So look at this. If I, decide, if I divide this by h, like some, some definitions do, this tells me that the difference operator is getting closer and closer to the original operator. Because this is, right, the original operator is dy dt equal to this, right? So consistency, as the word says, oh, am I consistent? Yes, because eventually I'm going to go to the right thing. That's how the word sort of colloquially speaking consistency means, right? So consistency is a notion of asymptotically having operators nearby, one near to the other, the discrete and the continuous. And stability is a notion of solutions being nearby, right? The exact and, and the numerical or the numerical in a perturbed numerical, and so on. Or even in, in, in theoretical ODEs, which is that the problem is well posed. That means you perturb it a little bit, the solution doesn't go crazy. Right? And the problem is well posed. OK? So this is consistency. <clears throat> then in some situations, yeah, soon I have to stop, because there will be another class, and I have to erase the board, and so on. But it's OK. I'm going to stop. I'm prepared to stop exactly at a good point for next week. So note that this is different if I say local error. Sometimes it's a little dubious, I think, in, 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 in books. But anyway, so local error, again, following, say, Lambert, local error is this. Right? And, and, and many times, it's associated to this. So sometimes look error in some books is like this, which means <clears throat> if you start your solution, you do the exact evolution from this point, which was numerical, right? What's the difference? Okay. And then there's global error, which is really the one we're more, right? And, and note that, for example, the local truncation error, we didn't really put exactly where the solution is starting from. So it's almost like we can think it's exact, whatever. It doesn't matter. It's more in the operator. And the global error would be this. <clears throat> and some norm that we might decide to choose. OK, so it's trying to see, right, if you want to do it L infinity, L2, whatever, it's right the, over the, the whole time interval of study, your global error that might have accumulated and so on. So, right, this, this will depend, this will depend on, um, on what we have to do, right? I mean, what are our interests? So it's just, uh, this is just to call your attention, right? I mean, this course is on numerical PDEs, and soon I'm going to move on to PDEs next week. I think just maybe finishing a little bit of ODEs on Monday, and even on Monday starting PDEs. But this, I think, is good as an exercise, as I'm seeing, for us to discuss, for you to see how I think, to set the language, to set, set the, the radar, right, for, oh, to react fast when something comes at you, and choosing this, choosing that. OK. so. Just pay attention that sometimes local error is different from local truncation error. That's all I want to put, basically, the, 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 the main communication here. OK, so now, hmm. let me see. You know what? I'm, I'm, I'm not going to have time to do this, I think. I don't want to rush. 
So let me say what I'm going to start for next class. So we're going to prove this. It's easy. <clears throat> I mean, it's, it's not trivial, trivial, but it's easy. So the theorem. Which is this convergence of explicit order? Okay. So, so not all, right, it's not always easy to prove the convergence of a numerical method, and as we'll see, the equivalence theorem is quite handy. There's an, a version of equivalence theorem for ODEs and equivalence theorem for linear PDEs. The linear PDEs one usually comes with the name of Lux, famous Lux, right, or Lux. Richmeyer. So the, what we're going to see, see is this. The convergence of Euler is that we're going to prove that, you know, if the ODE, I'm not going to write here or write next time. If the ODE is Lipschitz, blah, 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 everything usual that we know, so the Lipschitz constant is L. And the f is, or the second derivative of y, sorry, is bounded by this m. I'm going to write this all next time, OK? So this is bounded by this, right? That's it, yeah. OK, so we're going to get this estimate, right, that proves we'll do it next time. It's, it's, it's not difficult. I mean, so if, you know, I don't remember sometimes all the steps. So it's like if you start from scratch, It'll take a little time, but if you just follow the flow, it's, it's not that difficult, right? So step by step. So this has that difference between the numerical solution, this ve vector, and this function has these two components of error, right? This one, to start with, I would say this one's the most important one, which says that Euler is, as we discussed last time, in an asymptotic way, oh, the local truncation error, which is good to start. The local truncation error is h squared, but you accumulate it n times. n, asymptotically speaking, is of the order of 1 over h, so therefore it's first order. Right? That's a quick way, but it's not a proof. Here's the proof. It's first order because of this, as h goes to 0. This guy goes away. Depends on the Lipschitz constant. Right? This is the total time of the interval, which not necessarily as n, goes to as n goes to infinity or h, right, the h, the xn will be on this time. Doesn't matter. And this error here, right, is an error that maybe I might not be able to get rid of, which is of the initial condition, right? Because of the computer, it's finite digits, right? So whatever. If you ask me, if the initial condition is pi, well, it doesn't even have to be a finite digit. I'm going to have to truncate pi at some point. So there is a small error in the initial condition, either because I'm working in finite arithmetic or because you're really working on a problem that's um, associated to some physical problem, I mean physical meaning biology, finance, whatever, in which the initial condition came from a, an experiment, a data. So you might not have this exactly either, right? But if the problem is well posed, right, this is a little bit, then this you can make this be small, and eventually there's linear dependence, continuous dependence on data, and so on and so on, right? So this notion of continuous dependence on, for the problem to be well posed, continuous, continuous dependence on data, on information, meaning vector field not being perturbed, initial conditions not being perturbed, which we have it in ODs, right? And the theorems in ODs, I mean, the people who are doing the ODs course now, and I think I, I saw it browsing the book of Marcel and so on. You know, there's a part that's like not so true. Proof continuous dependence of these things. There's a version which looks pretty much the same. It's not trivial to prove either. And for example, Lambert says that the proof I think is in is in Isaacs and the Keller. If I if I don't forget, and I'm not even sure if the whole thing is in Isaacs and Keller because it's not a specialized book. But then you have the notion of well-posedness for the discrete problem, for the discrete operator that looks very much like the OD one. 
and it's called zero stability. That's the name given for basically proving that uh, continuous dependence on blah, 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 is called zero stability in ODs. And then I'll probably be finishing next class, which I mean, next I'll be finishing with ODs, which I'll, I'll present you this. I'll present you the definition of zero stability, that basically it's like a, at least, a th looks like the definition is a theorem which you will not prove, like a theorem for continuous dependence. But then, there's another very nice theorem that the first version was by Dahlquist, a famous name from the very good school, numerical analysis, which is the Swedish school, is a very strong school in numerical analysis, and Dahlquist has a very nice book in numerical methods. I actually have a copy of it, we have it in the library. Dahlquist in 56 proved an equivalence for zero stability, which is just looking at the zeros of polynomials. So it's very cool, very nice, and that's very easy to check. So that's, that's like a preview for our next class, so don't miss next class on Monday. And we're going to be wrapping up what I have to say about ODs, but as I think it's good to set the way of thinking, terminology, and then we'll move on to PDs. And as I said, most part of the course, not at the end, it will be very simple ODs. I mean, when we start with wave equations, it's going to be the unidirectional wave equation, very simple, but very good for us to test, test ideas and test, you know, put down concepts and so on. Okay, so I'll stop here and see you on Monday.